everybody. Again, my name is Jonathan Schiff. Uh, and he is Kelsey, already did a brief overview of AMR stenosis. I'm just going to go straight into the first place. So, as Kelsey mentioned, there are a few tablet valves out there that are approved for commercial use in the US. She covered Sapien XT and Sapien 3. There's also the core valve by Medtronic. Um, but there's also a number of other valves that, while not approved for commercial use, can be obtained in certain studies. And we at the Heart Hospital are now working with one of these valves, and that is called the direct flow transcatheter valve. We just began uh, enrolling in a study for this valve. So there's some key differences between direct flow and Sapien 3, um, mainly the uh, Sapien 3 is made out of metal, while direct flow is plastic. Uh, it also addresses the concern that leak around the valve with these two rings on top and bottom as compared to the skirt. Um, in order to see it on x ray, you have to inject dye into it. Uh, because it is made of plastic, obviously the uh, Edwards metal shows up. But the two biggest ones are that the direct flow valve is fully repositionable and fully retrievable. Now, as the physicians really like to say when they're explaining uh, the tablet procedure to our patients in clinic, a picture's worth a thousand words. So I have a brief video that goes over the oh, a brief video that goes over the direct flow procedure. I'm going to narrate this through it, or it's not coming through. It looks like we're having a wonderful litany of technical difficulties today. <laughs> That's great. Um, but the long and short of it is there are three positioning wires uh, that are used to expand and position the valve as compared to the Edwards valve, which is open to the balloon. And this allows the physicians to reposition it as many times as possible to minimize the leak around the valve. With the Edwards valve, as soon as you expand that balloon, that valve's in place. It's not going anywhere. And on top of that, there's a retrieval system designed for direct flow that can pull the valve out of the heart if it falls out. Now, there have been some previous studies <coughs> completed on this valve. Uh, the main one was the Discover trial out in Europe at these seven centers listed up there. There were 100 patients enrolled, and they looked at the outcomes of these patients in 24 months. So the first outcome they looked at was survival. On the x-axis, you see the days that have passed um, since each patient's tablet procedure. And on the y-axis, you see survival rates. And we found that at 24 months, 80% of patients had survived and that's a huge improvement. As uh, Kelsey mentioned, it's been found that 50% of patients who do nothing to fix their synodic valve don't survive past one year. So 80% in two years is a huge improvement. Then we also have mean gradient. Just to quickly review, mean gradient is the difference in pressure on either side of the valve. We found that before it's at about 46. As we mentioned before, the cutoff for aortic stenosis is usually set at about 40. And then after the procedure, it dropped to 14, and then continued to stay that low over two years. So we're finding that long term, the valve is keeping this gradient low and letting blood flow through. We also have uh, steps on the leak around the valve. Here we want to see as much green as possible because green is signifying no leak or trace leak around this valve. And we find that that is true in 85% of patients after two years. And the other 15% have only a mild leak, which is still not very major. And finally, we have NYHA class. Uh, NYHA is a way of um, categorizing the symptoms of patients in heart failure. Um, class 1 shows those symptoms. Class 2 will show them with exercise or heavy exertion. Class 3 will show symptoms with um, everyday activity. And class 4 shows them with rest. And what we found is that while only 42% of patients were in class 1 or 2 in baseline, after two years, 92% of patients were in these classes. And so we're seeing that not only is direct flow making their valves function better, but it's also making them feel better. So now we move on to the trial that we are a part of here at the Heart Hospital called the SALUS trial. This is a trial for high or extreme risk patients, and it's the 2 to 1 randomization to core valve. Now this is very interesting because the initial trials for earlier valves had to be randomized against surgery, and some still are, because surgical aortic valve replacement was always the gold standard. But now that TAVR is becoming more established, and these valves have been proven and ex 
accepted for commercial use, we're able to compare the outcomes of new valves against them. So the key inclusion criteria follow what uh, we diagnose as severe aortic stenosis, so mean grading above 40, and aortic valve area less than one, and then YHA class equal or of two or <coughs> Now the primary endpoints for this are to look at the rates of death, stroke, and leak around the valve in one year, and then the study team also wants to see the rates of leak around the valve, pacemaker implantation, and acute kidney injury through 30 days. So we've only enrolled one patient so far in the heart hospital. That's only because the trial is very new at this point. And this is our gentleman that we put our first valve in. He's an 85-year-old male. He came to us showing worsening shortness of breath on exertion. He had a history of comorbidities, uh, probably the most notable of which are coronary artery disease and 50 years of tobacco abuse. And between those and his class 3 heart failure, he had a projected risk of mortality by the Society of Thoracic Surgeons of 4.5%, which wouldn't be considered extreme, but he also had a comorbidity that we call porcelain aorta, which means the aorta has to be calcified, Inoperable. And because of this, we were able to enroll him in the direct flow trial and give him a direct flow valve. Now, it seems like my videos are not working, which is wonderful. Um, this was supposed to show the leak around the valve. We found only a very trace leak after this position. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like I'm not going to be able to show much, but we do have some photos of later things. More importantly, on day one, he was discharged for ICU. He was in a stable condition, and Kelsey and I had the great opportunity to see him while shadowing one of the physicians about eight hours after the procedure, and he looked great. He had color in his face, he was sitting up nicely, no shortness of breath, talking to us just fine. It was very, very promising. And then over the next few days, he was up and able to walk further and further each day, and on post-operative day three, he was deemed well enough to go home. Now, at baseline, we found a peak velocity of 4.1, which again is above our four, our cutoff of four, and a mean gradient of 36, and an aortic valve area of 0.81 centimeters squared. As you can see from the post deployment echo, these had all decreased considerably after the tap valve was put in, so we consider that a success. Now, moving on from talking about different types of valves, in this study, I'm going to start talking about some possible complications of the TAPR procedure. In this case, we're looking at stroke. So, as we mentioned before, aortic stenosis is caused by a buildup of calcium on the aortic valve. Now, during the TAPR procedure, it's possible for little bits of these calcium to break off from the valve while uh, the TAPR valve is being expanded. And if they break off, they can go into the bloodstream and then up to the brain, and this can potentially cause a stroke in patients. Now this is an MRI of one of our patients that was in the study. You can see those big white dots are where these bits of calcium landed, and this patient actually was diagnosed with a stroke. Uh, but that is exactly what we want to prevent, and that is caused by the calcium on the valve, and so that was what we considered the need for a study like this. So, in order to assess this study, we wanted to see not only how often we're finding these bits of calcium breaking off, but also see if they're causing any sort of noticeable cognitive effect on the patient. And to do that, we used a test such as this. This is called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And we asked the patient to complete some simple tasks, such as drawing a cube, drawing a clock at a certain time, naming animals, or memorizing some words or numbers. However, we see that even baseline, patients have some trouble completing some of these tasks. And as they're already not 100% there, so to speak, cognitively, we would definitely want to make sure that we're not impairing them any farther. So in order to test this, we wanted to see how their cognitive scores change over time. So we did an assessment at baseline once they were enrolled. Then we gave them a tapper valve, and before they left the hospital, we gave them an MRI to check for any infarctions. At discharge, we gave them one assessment, and we brought them back for a 30-day follow-up and gave them one final assessment. So, for this study, we enrolled 19 patients. Uh, 
Um, 15 of those 19 complete MRI, and we managed to find infarctions in all 15. However, only one of those 15 showed symptoms of a stroke from those infarctions. More interestingly, we found that between baseline discharge and follow-up, there was no significant difference between their cognitive assessment scores. As Kelsey mentioned before, those bars uh, on each of the graph are the competence intervals, and as you can see, all three are very well within each other's competence intervals. There's absolutely no significant difference. And so we're finding that even though all of these patients are having these bits of calcium break off, it's not causing them any detriment, at least in the short term. And so that's interesting to think about going forward because stroke is one of the biggest complications of TAVR, and we want to do everything we can to prevent it. So there are some companies out there that are creating these devices called embolic protection devices that are supposed to stop the calcium from entering the bloodstream and going up to the brain. Now, although we are finding that there is no significant difference in um, their cognitive faculties, we are still finding this calcium in every single patient. And this is just one study. So it's interesting to look at these results moving forward because we see that it's so common for this calcium to break off. It's very important that we look into doing everything we can to stop. So finally, we have our case series. It's on coronary occlusion in tavern. So you can see here, um, those arrows are pointing to where our coronary arteries are. As you can see on the photo on the left, coronary artery is currently being filled with dye, it's wide open. And then on the right, in that same area where the coronary artery should be, there's no filling, which means that it has been blocked off at some point during this procedure. Now, the way we measure coronary height, which is one of our big things with coronary occlusion, is we look at the bottom of the aortic uh, valve opening, as you can see by the dotted line, and we measure up onto where the opening of the left and right coronary arteries are. Now, these arteries are very, very important because they supply blood to the heart muscle, and blocking them off is actually what causes heart attacks. So, there have been not too many studies on coronary occlusion because it is a fairly rare complication of TAVR. Uh, one study found that it was less than 1%, about 0.66% prevalence. Um, but regardless, we really want to protect against it because we find the consequences are very severe. From this study, they found that after 30 days, 41% of the patients who had this complication during their procedure had passed away. So, this is often caused by the native leaflet that's being pushed out of the way of the tabber valve, pushing up against the opening of the coronary artery and blocking it off. Uh, that's what they found held true for 43 of the 44 cases. And the physicians can see this by uh, persistent low blood pressure in the patient and potential heart failures. Now these were the main risk factors that were identified for coronary occlusion. But the two that I'd like to focus on are the left coronary artery height and the right coronary artery height, highlighted in red. They found that on average, the height of the left coronary artery in cases that had an occlusion was 10.4 millimeters, and in cases where the right coronary artery was included, the height was 11.3 millimeters. However, we felt that at the heart hospital, we've had much better results than this with people who had significantly lower coronaries than 10 or 11 millimeters. And so we wanted to see what was being do, done differently. So we looked for patients who had undergone TAP with coronary heights less than or equal to 10 millimeters. We looked at their CT measurements and any impressions that were made from that CT. We checked to see if any protective measures were used. Uh, these include a what we call a root shot, where dye is injected into the aorta while the balloon is being blown up to check if the coronary arteries are filling, and also a wire placement where a catheter with put down into one of the coronary arteries in case it gets blocked off so that we can blow it up. And we also looked to see if we excluded any patients from having TAVR and we wanted to know why. Again, I believe I'm having technical difficulties, which is a real shame. Um, but this was just a video showing 
the uh, and it was being filled during a room shot and also pointing out the water that goes down the corner there. So we found that out of 278 patients over the last about three and a half years, 69 of them, or 25%, had coronaries less than or equal to 10 millimeters. And of those 69 patients, we found that 23 of those had coronaries less than or equal to 8 millimeters. But what was most interesting is that we only used protective measures in 14.5% of those cases, and we had no cases of occlusion. Now, this seems to tell us that careful CT screening and sizing of the valve and positioning during surgery are some of the main components of preventing occlusion from happening in most patients. And in patients that have very low coronaries or some other high risk, uh, we can use these protective measures to uh, give us better assurance that nothing bad will happen. And we also found four cases that were excluded from TAVR and we performed surgical aortic valve replacement on them instead. And that was in cases of either extremely low coronaries, uh, issues with the size of the aortic valve opening itself, or other comorbidities that would need to be solved with surgery. And we believe that following this and mostly using careful planning, we can keep the occurrence of coronary collision very low and hopefully at zero. So this is one of the patients that we uh, assessed and put about before the study. And she is an 88 year old female. She came to us with heart palpitations, fatigue, and mild shortness of breath on exertion. She had these comorbidities and class 3 heart failure, which gave her projected risk of mortality from surgery of 9.77%, which is what we would classify as high risk. So we went ahead and did a CT to check the heights of her arteries, and we found that the left coronary artery had a height of 7.26 millimeters, and the right had a height of 7.05 millimeters. Now these are very low, and so we decided so it was said that because of this and because of the sizing of her aortic valve opening, TAVR would be very, very difficult to perform in her and we would need to take protective measures. And so this again was supposed to show the protective measures, um, but we set her up to have uh, a Sapien XT valve implanted. It was put in successfully with a BAV root shot and with the wire put down the coronary artery. Um, after the valve was implanted, we injected her with that and found that the coronary arteries were still filling just fine. Now, she did have some problems in the hospital. Um, she had a normal heart rhythm and low blood levels for a few days. She had a GI bleed after five days, and unfortunately it took her 14 days to um, get stable, begin walking, and getting around independently. Um, but after those 40 days, she wasn't playing with shortness of breath. She felt much better. She was deemed safe to send home. Um, however, these problems were not due to any sort of occlusion. They were just due to the comorbidities that she already had. Um, and again, we find that between her initial evaluation and post-deployment, the pressure gradient had decreased at maximum from 85 to 8 and the aortic valve area had increased from 0.76 centimeters squared to 2.03 centimeters squared. So again, even in patients with very low coronaries, much lower than was being cited by the previous study, we found that we could successfully put a tavern back in. So I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. I'd like to thank the doctors for uh, leading us through clinics and surgeries and letting us get an incredible experience and feel of how uh, cardiovascular medicine works this summer. I'd like to thank Amy and Katie, who unfortunately isn't here, for choosing us in the first place and leading us through this incredible summer, and to all of the BRI and Christie staff for giving us help whenever we ask and just being great friends and co-workers all summer. And again, thank you all for coming.
questions for Jonathan? You know. <laughs> <laughs> Great job, Jonathan. Again, like Kelsey, you, you did a very nice job of explaining a complicated problem to hopefully the audience here that will go home with some uh, better education on what both of y'all have done. Do you, uh, uh, you've seen some of the procedures with the wires to protect the corners, right? So again, summarize again why you think there are fewer complications here at the Harvard Hospital than there are by Dr. Rivera in his paper from uh, the Journal of American College of Cardiology. I believe that it is mainly careful planning. Um, I've seen the doctors uh, deliberate for over long stretches of time about any patient that has problematic corners. Um, and we do protective measures as needed, but obviously what we're finding is that most of the time they're not needed. Even when we put in, they're again just as a potential method of protection, not as an absolute thing. So it seems that from sizing the valves correctly, um, performing surgical replacement on patients when necessary, and um, just carefully deploying the valve during surgery as well, that we are able to perform the tavern on patients with more blood than they have. Thank you. I have one What do you think about the direct flow valve compared to the safety valve? Do you think it's going to be as good as a valve? I think um, the direct flow valve has some small things that could be tweaked. Um, I think the biggest thing is that it has a very high profile. Uh, and so we need patients with very high coronary arteries to make sure that they're not blocked off by the valve. But in those patients that have enough height to take that valve, I think it has the potential to work just as well as Sapien, uh, especially once our team gets completely used to it and can do it um, you know, just as quickly and efficiently as a Sapien.